Hello, it's Wednesday, middle of the week, it means we're halfway to the weekend. Uh, this is your second video for week two, and this is about colonial society. And I'm not going to lie, this is going to have quite a bit of stuff in it, and I apologize. It's the way the semester works, I have to put a lot of things into this video. Uh, this is pretty much going to finish up our, our colonial period in America. And I'm going to start with Plymouth Colony, um, better known as Plymouth Rock, better known as the Pilgrims. You've heard of the Pilgrims, but you may not know a lot about them. Uh, first of all, they come to the New World in November of 1620. And these Pilgrims, they're a radical group of Calvinists. We don't really use the word Calvinist anymore, but some words you may have heard of before, Presbyterian, Congregationalist, or Puritan. Uh, a Calvinist is a Presbyterian, a Calvinist is a Congregationalist, a Calvinist is a Puritan. The Pilgrims were a radical group of the Calvinists, and they thought that the only way to purify Christianity was by separating completely from the Church of England. Um, and before they came to the Americas, the Pilgrims actually moved from England to Holland or the Netherlands but they were afraid of being taken over by Catholic Spain, so they decided to move elsewhere. Uh, the ship they used to get to New World is the Mayflower. Usually in class, I would ask how many of the people on the Mayflower do you think were pilgrims? More often than not, people will say all of them or most of them, but in reality, of the 100 people that were on the Mayflower, only 30 of them were pilgrims. Only 30 of them. They were a minority. Also, while on the Mayflower, there is a legal document called the Mayflower Compact that's signed. And this is one of the first written agreements in the New World, in the English colonies. And what the Mayflower Compact was supposed to do is allow religious freedom to those non-separatists, those non-pilgrims, and it gave the colony a basic system of politics and legal uh, authority. Now when the settlers land, it's winter. I don't know if any of you have been to Massachusetts in November. It's cold, it's snowy, it's not a lot of fun. <clears throat> so they have to very quickly build shelter and only half of them are going to survive to the next year. They do receive some assistance from Native Americans. That's not a lie. Uh, there's a group of people called the Poconokets. And the Poconokets are going to give the settlers food. They're going to show them what to plant and how to plant. But nothing happens like you see in Thanksgiving. That's not true. Uh, the leader of the Poconokets was a native named Squanto. <clears throat> Squanto was shown as being helpful to the pilgrims. But in reality, he is taken back to England as a captive. And he is forced to learn English so he can become a translator. There's also this guy named William Bradford who wrote a book called Of Plymouth Plantation. And Of Plymouth Plantation is a book available on the internet. You can go to a library and get it. And William Bradford, he wrote down the end-all, be-all history of the Pilgrims. <clears throat> he was the colonial governor five times. He served from 1590 to 1657 as the leader of the Pilgrims. And his book tells all about their journey, all about their quest. It tells you what happened to all 100 people on the Mayflower. If you ever have anybody who says, yeah, my family are descended from pilgrims, you can ask them to prove it because William Bradford knows exactly who every single one was. Another colony is the Massachusetts Bay Colony. This one was set up near Boston. And this is also Puritans, but they were mainstream Puritans. They weren't quite as radical. They weren't quite as crazy. And Massachusetts Bay is settled in 1629. Um, they are going to buy part of the Virginia Company's claim to the New World, and they're going to be allowed to settle by King James I. So 1628, these Puritan merchants, they buy claims to the New World. They formed the Massachusetts Bay Company. 
and the first settlers are going to land around Boston in 1629. And they're led by a guy named John Winthrop, who is a Puritan preacher. And you're going to have 700 settlers, it's men, it's women, it's children, and these are all going to be middle class and farming families. John Winthrop is also going to write one of the most famous pieces of early American literature, and it's called A Model of Christian Charity, which is something that you're supposed to read this week, actually. And A Model of Christian Charity, it tells you all about what John Winthrop expects his new colony to be. It's going to be this godly community. It's not driven by profit. Uh, they're going to try to set the example on what a new community should be like. And they also basically want to shame the Church of England and show how wrong the Church of England is and force them to reform. The most famous phrase from the model of Christian charity is that he wants his new colony to be a shining city on a hill. Now these New England communities, both in the Massachusetts Bay Colony and in the Plymouth Colony, uh, they're going to be centered on the church. The church is literally in the center of town. Everybody has to walk past the church. Membership in the church is required. Church attendance is required. You're also required to give money to the church. Um, public meetings happen at the church. The public officials are all members of the church. And technically church and state are separate, but in reality they're not. So the church laws, the church rules often become the community laws and the community rules. The preacher is very often going to be one of the most powerful people in town. Now as far as the physical layout goes, I didn't put it down here, but just kind of listen for a minute. Uh, the villages, they're centered around the church house. Most of the homes are within one mile of the church house. And that's because the people need to be close enough to hear the church bell if the church bell rings. The families are given a piece of property and very often that property is on the opposite side of this village from where they live. That's to make sure that all of the townspeople cross paths with each other and see each other. Part of it is to get to know your neighbor and part of it is to keep an eye on your neighbor. And if you find your neighbor doing something they're not supposed to do, you're supposed to report your neighbor to the church. Now the husband is going to be the head of the family. Everybody, the wife and the children, any servants, they all have to obey the authority of the husband. Marriage is not a private affair. The church can stop a marriage if they don't agree. The church can also peek in your window and see what you're doing in, in the privacy of your family's life. Women have no property rights. They're treated like minors. Uh, children have no property rights until they are of age. And the population is going to grow rapidly in these New England communities, mainly because there's an even number of men and women. All right, not everything is happy. There are some religious dissenters. There are some people that don't agree with the way things are done. And the first one is Roger Williams. Roger Williams originally was from the Massachusetts Bay Colony, but he said that church and state should remain absolutely separate. There should be no crossover whatsoever. Roger Williams, he was against mandatory church attendance. He was against being forced to give money to the church. And for his views, his prize was to be kicked out of the colony. So he and some of his followers moved south and they purchased land from the Narragansett Native Americans and they create what becomes known as Providence Colony. Now you may have heard of the city of Providence, Rhode Island. That is the colony founded by Roger Williams. So Roger Williams, his colony lives on today with the state of Rhode Island. Another religious dissenter was a woman named Anne Hutchinson. Uh, she thought that the main way church should be done is salvation of grace. I mean, you don't have to do any extra work. You just have to accept Christianity and 
admit fault and that's good enough. She also thought that women needed to play a major role in public, which is completely against what the Puritans believed. So she too was banished from the Massachusetts Bay Colony and when she is dead, when she dies, she's brought back to the Massachusetts Bay Colony and the authorities are going to claim she's pregnant with the child of the devil and they're going to execute her after she's already dead. Pretty gruesome. You also have Quakers and Baptists. Today, Baptists, you find a Baptist church on every street corner. But once upon a time, they were a small sect, a small subgroup of Christianity. And they were banished and executed from these pilgrim-held lands or these Puritan-held lands. Same thing with the Quakers, which I'll talk about about more in a few minutes. Now the Salem Witch Trials, you may or may not have heard of these before. Um, you could do an entire semester class on the Salem Witch Trials alone, so I'm just going to try and give you the, the basics. Um, this happens late 1691 going into 1692. You end up with 300 people being accused of witchcraft. More than 30 people are hanged. Uh, there's no burning at the stake though, firewood was too valuable, so they just hung them from trees. Now there are two girls, there's Betty Paris who's a 9 year old girl, and there's her cousin Abby Williams who is an 11 year old girl. Uh, they both begin to act out, they both begin to do strange things like bark, throw epileptic fits, uh, random outbursts, it's a real show. And according to tradition, um, or according to history, this all started because a slave by the name of Tituba told the fortune of these two girls. And supposedly, while telling this story, or telling the fortune of these two, ter two girls, Tituba changed them into witches. <clears throat> now, eventually, fingers start to be pointed and there are three women who are blamed at first. Sarah Good, who was a homeless woman, Sarah Osborne, who was a poor woman, and then Tituba, who was the slave of the Paris family. All three say are trying to save their lives and they say, yes, yes, I'm a slave, please don't kill me. And Tituba begins to name other people and before you know it, there's this mob mentality that breaks out and everybody is being accused of being a witch. Bunch of residents go to jail. Bunch of confessions are obtained. In one of those confessions you have to read this week, the confession of Anne Foster. And one thing you'll notice is the confessions change. Um, each time the person is told to confess, they change their story because they're trying to save their life. Now, trials begin in April. By the end of summer, you have the 30 plus people who are hanged. Dozens more are in jail waiting to be put to death. And these girls are going to confess they made it all up. And they are going to be banished from the colony for what they did. Think about that. 30 plus lives lost because two girls made up the story of being turned into witches. In reality, what happened, there was this, um, not bacteria, there was this fungus in the bread they ate called ergot. And this ergot fungus caused people to have epileptic seizures, caused people to act strangely, and was probably the cause for what the two girls were experiencing. Alright, moving on from here, Utopian Colonies. But before I do Utopian Colonies, this is a good place to put that secret word for the week, or for this Wednesday. And I'm just going to be real simple. Um, I'm going to use cat, C-A-T. I have quite a few cats, and one of them just won't leave me alone. So your secret word for this video lecture is cat, C-A-T. Alright, so after I've gotten the secret word out of the way, let's talk about utopian colonies. Uh, these utopian colonies, they're built from the ideas of the Enlightenment where people should 
get along and you should help the poor etc etc and there are really two of these utopian colonies one is Pennsylvania one is Georgia now you might be wondering why I have the Quaker Oats guy on here well that's not the Quaker Oats guy that's actually William Penn who is the founder of Pennsylvania and he founds he, he creates Pennsylvania in 1681 now William Penn was a member of the Society of Friends known as the Quakers and this is one of the most influential radical groups of the New World. <clears throat> the idea behind the, the Quakers is they have no formal sacraments, they have no formal ministers, they're going to live the simple life, they're pacifists and they accept everybody. And William Penn, he's going to provide a place for all of the small religious groups to come and live because he promises religious tolerance. So you end up with Mennonites, you end up with the Amish, you end up with Baptists, you end up with pretty much everybody who is not Puritan or Church of England coming to Pennsylvania. You also have Georgia and the bottom picture that is Sir James Oglethorpe, the founder of Georgia. James Oglethorpe was a military man who turns into a prison reformer and he comes up with this idea of taking people out of prison who are there because they owe debts, bringing them to the New World and letting them earn money to pay their debts off. Now Georgia is unique because at first land holdings were limited to 500 acres you could not sell or buy more land no alcohol no slaves this causes a problem very quickly because some people their 500 acres are better than others some people have 500 acres of great soil can grow everything some people have 500 acres of rocks under the original rules of georgia you couldn't sell your land no alcohol well why is that a big deal if you've ever been to savannah right across the border is South Carolina. South Carolina had all the alcohol you could ever drink. So people would go across the river and get drunk and then come back home. No slaves. Why is that a big deal? Once again, South Carolina. Lots of slaves in South Carolina and people in Georgia were jealous of people in South Carolina. Last but not least, Georgia was founded as a buffer colony between South Carolina and Florida. Basically, if you, in gaming terms, if you will, Georgia was supposed to be a meat shield. If Spanish Florida attacked, Georgia was supposed to take the attack and defeat the Spanish before they can get to South Carolina. Now you also have to talk about colonial population increase. There's a huge increase in the number of people in the English colonies during the 1700s. Uh, there's over 650,000 documented immigrants. Half of those plus are unwilling because they were slaves. There's also natural population growth. There's early marriages. Usually people are going to be married by the age of 20. Frequent births. Uh, there's usually a birth every two years. So if you are female and you're listening to this and you're 20, you would have already had two kids if this was colonial times. And then there's lower mortality rates as well. People aren't dying as often and the age of death starts to go up. And then last but not least, you have this European immigration. You have Scots-Irish, Scots, and Northern English who come here in 1720. They move to New England and then they start moving south and then eventually they get to Georgia. The same thing with Germans. Germans, they enter the country around 1750, they start out in Pennsylvania, and they start moving south as well. I have to briefly tell you there is competition between England, France, and Spain. Um, France, even though they only sent over about a thousand settlers a year, there is some competition. Uh, the Spanish are mostly in the southwest, but they're all kind of converging on the Mississippi River Valley, and that's where a lot of the competition happens. And European populations are going to use the natives against each other. Uh, different European groups are going to promise different things and the Europeans are going to use natives against each other and against themselves as well. And then last but not least, you do have African populations you have to talk about. 
Um, somewhere around 325,000 slaves are brought over to North America during the 1700s. And almost as soon as slaves get to the New World, there are slave revolts. In 1712 in New York City, there's a conspiracy between slaves and poor whites to burn down the city. Uh, the plot is discovered before it can happen. 31 blacks and four whites are charged with conspiracy and they're all executed. And then 1739 in South Carolina, you have what's known as the Stono Rebellion. Uh, it starts when there are 20 slaves who rebel. They get muskets from a warehouse and they and about 80 others start to march south towards Florida where they think they'll be safe. Along the way, they burn down seven plantations, they kill 20 white people, and they're captured one day after the rebellion starts. So one day, they're able to burn down seven plantations. All of the slaves who are captured are executed, their heads are cut off, and their heads are put on spikes to be a deterrent against future slave revolts. All right, what was daily life like in the colonies? Well, this was the time where the enlightenment was happening. So you have these new political ideas, these new scientific ideas. I don't have enough time to go through the enlightenment in this class, but if you're interested in it, I do talk about it in world history. There is a form of education that you're expected to take. Um, you're supposed to know the basics of reading, writing, and arithmetic, but in reality, less than half of the men master that, and none of the women. Most of the women in the English colonies are illiterate. And education is going to become a status symbol. If you have money, typically you're educated, and those who were educated were usually uh, not trusted. The lack of literacy means that there's this oral culture. Things are told person to person. News travels slow, stories travel slow. It's almost like a big giant game of telephone if you've ever played that. And then there's also this elite culture. The wealthier businessmen, the wealthier planter, the wealthier politicians, they develop this different culture. Uh, typically, they're going to go back to England to get their, their education or to New England to places like Yale and Harvard to get their education. And they're going to set themselves apart. Um, they're going to have large scale parties. They're going to build larger residences. Um, you know, not large like today, but an average size house today would have been a mansion back then. Uh, they're going to have different uh, fashions, such as uh, coats with long tails, powdered wigs, um, manners. They're going to you know, eat with their pinky up, so to speak, or drink with their pinky up. And they expect everybody to defer to them and look up to them. Uh, briefly, with religion, um, Congregationalists, or the Puritans, and Episcopalians, meaning the Church of England, they worship in this hierarchy. Uh, you've got defined roles in the church. The preacher, the pastor is at the top, then the deacons, and then the regular people. In Congregationalist churches and in Episcopalian churches, the wealthy families, they purchase all the church pews, push out all of the poor and then the poor are forced to go and create their own churches somewhere else. Quakers, on the other hand, uh, their services are open to everybody. Their services are informal. Uh, men and women are both active in church services. In many cases, they're equally active. But church leaders are still typically going to be chosen from the community. By the time we get to the 1700s, most people living in colonial North America, they don't attend church regularly. They're either living too far from churches or they're too far from pastors. So church attendance might be a once a month or twice a month thing. The most important thing to come out of colonial religion at this time though is the Great Awakening. Um, there's this idea that people have fallen away from the church uh, there are some people that think that religion has become too intellectual, uh, people are too skeptical, there's too much money flowing around, and two real big names, Jonathan Edwards and George Whitefield. Um, <clears throat> Jonathan Edwards, his famous 
contribution to history is sinners in the hands of an angry God. Basically, God is holding you over the pit of hell, and it's only by chance you haven't fallen. Um, basically, Jonathan Edwards' God is a vengeful, wrathful God who is just looking for a reason to cast you into the fire. And then you got George Whitefield, who um, he preaches. I don't know why I wrote priests, but he preaches to crowds of thousands. And he believed in this idea of big tent revival, if you will. And he went from city to city preaching to thousands. And uh, he became one of the founding people of the Methodist Church. Most people know uh, Wesley as being the founder of the Methodist Church. Whitefield had just as big of a role in it. And um, Jonathan Edwards went to one of George Whitefield's sermons and he himself, the man who said, your foot shall slide in good time, thought he was going to hell because of how effective Whitefield was as a preacher. All right, politics. We're moving on here. We're almost done. Uh, most of the colonies are going to develop a very similar political structure. You're going to have a governor at the top. He's the most powerful figure. Below that, you're going to have a legislature. Usually there are two houses, meaning bicameral. Only New Jersey, if I remember correctly, is going to have a unicameral, a one house. But usually you're going to get two houses. There's a house of commons, which you could think of like the House of Representatives, and the House of Burgesses, which you could think of like the Senate. Um, the members of these two houses were elected by landholders. Uh, there were different qualifications to vote depending on the different houses and depending on the colony sometimes the legislatures could pass laws sometimes they could only act as advisors it just depended <clears throat> as i said previously most of the work is done at the county level at the local level uh, county judges are what people dealt with on a day-to-day -day experience so by the time we get to 1700s, there's already this large idea of self-government. So the American Revolution, it doesn't come out of nowhere. It's not a surprise. The colonies were self-governed almost from the beginning. And people get used to that idea of self-government. And when the English crown begins to kind of take away that self-government, that's when people start to get angry. All right, last but not least, colonial economics. I'm gonna try to get you done within 30 minutes or less. In New England, the economy was originally about the fur trade. Um, most of the wild animals were killed. There wasn't much fur left. So then they switched to exporting stuff to the Caribbean. So New England is gonna export food and wood to the Caribbean islands. The southern colonies, they're going to do a lot of trade with England. They're going to export to England things like tobacco, rice, and indigo. And in exchange, they're going to get finished products that they use in their day-to-day -day lives. And North America is really part of this mercantilism system, this mercantilist economic system. I know that's a big word. It sounds scary. But to make it simple, um, people in the 1700s and the 1600s thought there was only so much money in the world. You could never get more money. And so all the different countries were fighting over the same finite amount of money in the world. And the ultimate goal of mercantilism was to create a self-sufficient country where you didn't need anybody else. These colonies were meant to help England become self-sufficient because instead of having to buy goods from France or Russia or whatever, they can just take what they need from their colonies. All right, so one final thing for today. I've got 30 seconds left to get you out in 30 minutes. For this week, you have your first reflection paper due. Um, it should be a page and a half long, double space it. Pick one of the readings from the past two, two weeks. Your first paragraph should be just be a short summary of the reading. I'm doing Anne Foster's confession. She confessed to being a witch. Here's what she had to say. And for the rest of it, the rest of the page to page and a half, tell me what you feel about it. Tell me what you think about it. 
Tell me why you feel the way you do and what you want me to know about your point of view. All right, I hope you have a good weekend. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.